Hi, we're happy to have uh, Tara Brendel uh, starting her first lecture, telling us about the curve complex and duality for mapping class groups. So, hi, um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but I'm not always so good at remembering to do that. So please do tell me if, if I need to see anything there. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to join you all. I wish I could be there uh, in person. Um, so um, today I'm gonna, so my focus for my three lectures is gonna be on the mapping class group of a finite type surface and how this theme of, of duality um, and cohomology plays out there that we've been hearing about all day today. So I'm gonna begin by highlighting some of the, the points we've already heard a little bit about in some of the earlier talks that are gonna be particularly relevant for um, this strand of, uh, of our studies this week. So um, we, we're gonna start with a surface. And so um, we, we are gonna attach three indices uh, to our surface. So we have the genus G, N will be the number of punctures, um, which we may occasionally think of as marked points on the surface for convenience. Uh, and B is gonna be the number of boundary components of our surface. And in general, because that's just a lot to write and it gets very cluttered, um, I'm just going to write S um, and uh, if, if I need to be specific about any of that, uh, I, will, I will try to do so as we go. So the mapping class group, um, which um, bizarrely is often denoted mod S, uh, so that's for type Miller modular group, um, we're gonna take as our definition, uh, it's gonna be the set of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the surface rel boundary. So in a fixed point wise on the boundary and all isotopies. So we're modding out by things that are isotopic to the identity. Everything's gonna fix the boundary point wise, um, but our punctures will be permuted set wise, unless uh, I do this and write a P, um, in which case this means um, punctures also fixed uh, point wise. Okay, so actually for a good bit of this, um, we're gonna need that notation. So um, if you're not familiar with this group, and I know from the chats that a lot of you uh, already are familiar with this group. Um, so you might be familiar with Farb Margulit's book, The Primer on Mapping Class Groups. And um, I always like the way that introduces the topic because it's sort of very dramatic. I mean, and it's very in keeping with our, our theme here today because it's all about, you know, the mantra of geometric group theory is nice groups acting nicely on nice spaces. So you learn nice things. And, you know, so they start the book with, you know, the group and then they define the mapping class group. And the next thing is the space and it's Teichmiller space. Okay, so um, Teichmiller space, if you've not encountered it before, um, is really just, um, it's, it's a lot like the moduli space of uh, a hyperbolic surface or a Riemann surface, um, except you're, you're sort of keeping track of, a, uh, of curves on the surface. You have a marking in other words. So it's um, the set of let's say hyperbolic surfaces um, together with a map from your fixed surface S to your surface X. So P uh, in this case is the marking and it's up to a certain equivalence. And the equivalence is that you say that two points in type or two representatives in type Miller space, two of these pairs um, are equivalent um, if we can find an isometry that makes this diagram equivalent uh, up to homotopy, okay? Um, so this is a space we could have a whole lecture series just about its fascinating properties and why it is such a nice space to study. Um, so let me just tell you a, a couple of key properties um, that are relevant to our discussion. So, um, so first of all, topologically, it's actually a really boring space. It's just R to some power, 
where the power depends on all of those indices that we laid out on the previous slide. So, um, so I've written out uh, the formula here. So we'll think of the dimension of tight Miller space as some function of G, B, and N. And I just wanted to give you some intuition because I think it's useful for where this comes from. So, um, you know, basically, um, it comes from a pants decomposition of the surface. So I have drawn a closed surface here of genus two, and I'll just make up an arbitrary pants decomposition here. So um, maybe I'll draw this one down here out of the way. So um, in general, um, a closed surface has 3G minus three simple closed curves in any pants decompositions. So that just means if we cut along um, these curves, we get some number of copies of a pair of pants. Um, and so if I add, actually, let me draw a picture here. So if I change this, like if I add a boundary component, okay, so there I've tried to put in a boundary component. Now, I don't have enough curves in my pants decomposition anymore. For every boundary component I add, I'm going to need an additional simple closed curve to get a complete pants decomposition. Um, and the way that tight Muller space works is, um, so how do you get this dimension? So you really are just kind of working backwards. You're gluing up pairs of pants to make your surface. Okay, so, um, a pair of pants is just a surface of genus zero with three boundary components. And so what you need um, to get this dimension, you have three G minus three plus two B uh, length parameters. Um, so I need to tell you the length of each curve in this pants decomposition. Um, but when I glue two of them together, I also need to tell you sort of how to glue them together. And there's something called the twist parameter. There's a way to, to make this precise um, using uh, geodesic arcs on the pair of pants. Um, and I shouldn't say equals here, because um, what I want to do is add this. Um, so I need, so notice I don't need to glue the boundary to anything. So I lose. Um, one uh, twist parameter here compared to the number of length parameters that I need. And when I add that up, I get 6G minus six plus three B. Now, where does the two N come from? Well, if you just think about the fact that if I want to, instead of thinking of this as a boundary component, if I want to sort of collapse this down to a puncture, what I can really do is think of that as just setting the length parameter equal to zero. So um, instead of having um, three dimensions for every puncture, I'm just gonna have two dimensions for every puncture. Okay, so I'll refer you, if, if you're, hopefully that gives you enough to get an intuition here. Um, again, you, know, you just wanna think of it as uh, a surface with some kind of hyperbolic structure. And Thurston always used to talk about it as, you know, wearing the pants, okay? You're, you're keeping track of how you're wearing the pants. So um, if you've ever, Thurston used to always say, it's like putting a onesie on a baby, okay? So I feel like I, I ought to pass this on because I think this intuition is really helpful. Um, you know, the, the onesie, and the baby have their intrinsic geometry. Um, but if you, you know, if you get the foot wrong in the onesie, then the leg gets all twisted round and the baby is definitely wearing the onesie in a sort of fundamentally different way. The seam is getting Dane twisted around the baby's leg basically. So that's a useful way to, to distinguish between um, the tight Miller space of the surface and um, the moduli space of a surface. So, um, you know, and as we've heard about in previous talks, the mapping class group is acting nicely on this space. It's acting properly discontinuously. Um, it acts with finite stabilizers. That's basically by virtue of the fact, if you unpack the definition, what it means to stabilize a point in tight Muller space, it means that up to conjugacy, you're just an isomorphism of a hyperbolic surface, which means you have to be finite because those groups are finite. So it has all of these nice properties. And as we heard before, um, so there I wrote down the action for you. 
Um, so from my viewpoint, what we take as the definition of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces, uh, the quotient of tight molar space under the action of the mapping class group. And this is not a proper classifying space, it's, it's an orbifold classifying space or a rational classifying space. So you are gonna get some corners here because of that torsion. So, um, so anyway, but the reason that we want to study all of this um, is because certainly um, this week, our purpose is we're interested in cohomology. And so what this is saying is that, you know, if we want to understand the cohomology in the mapping class group, at least rationally, um, we're also understanding the cohomology of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces here. So, and again, we, we heard about this powerful analogy with um, SLN, and uh, we've heard about the, the rational tits building here. It's this abstract simplicial complex where you have K simplices corresponding to um, K plus one, um, I'll just say here, connected spaces. Other people use different words for this. That just means that um, in our abstract simplicial complex, um, you put uh, an edge between two vertices um, if one of them is a subspace that's contained in the other, okay? Um, and, and I'm writing this down again, even though we've already heard about it because there, it's such a powerful analogy with mapping class groups and I'd like to highlight that as we go. So, um, okay, so what do we know here that will motivate our work for mapping class groups? Well, so we have these results of Solomon Tits that, um, uh, <clears throat> that the rational Tits building is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres and uh, it's an infinite wedge of spheres. And um, the Steinberg module, which is sort of the top homology there, um, is also cyclic as an SLNQ module. Now that's a theorem of Solomon Tits and something I'm gonna be talking about more tomorrow is actually um, a theorem of Ash Rudolph that um, the Steinberg module is cyclic as an SLNZ module. Um, so really what I'm gonna be talking about is the analog for that in the case of mapping class groups. And I know we've seen this picture already, but um, I, I'm gonna to have to draw it again, I can't resist. Um, so, um, so, so by the way, today's talk is really gonna be focused on the analog of this first statement um, for mapping class groups. So um, that is work of Herer. And um, tomorrow's talk is going to be focused more on an analog of number three, which is work of Broadus, just to give you a preview here. And, you know, one of the things I just want to say here is, um, you know, if we, we saw this picture of the generators for the Steinberg module um, in this case, and Peter drew this picture for us, uh, for example, in the first lecture this morning. And if I have, um, so if I write down the apartment corresponding to some basis, right, I've got one dimensional subspaces corresponding to each of my three basis vectors. And then I've got two dimensional subspaces sort of sitting in between. Each one gets their own um, vertex. Uh, and so if you weren't here this morning, I guess you're getting to see this for the first time. So we get this triangle um, but of course, in, in homotopy, that's just a sphere, right? So this is, um, this is one of the generating spheres for, um, uh, for the rational tits building. And it's so nice, it's so satisfying. You can just draw the picture and there it is. Um, and, and this is where Broadus's contribution was on the mapping class group side. And it's something that, that doesn't come out of Herer's work, which is what I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, so, okay, so let's move on to mapping class groups world because that's really what we wanna focus on, but that's, that's our, our motivating uh, analogy there. Keep all of that in mind that we've already heard about. So, so the curve complex, or um, this was introduced by Harvey in 77. So this is the analog of the TITS building 
for mapping class groups. And so <clears throat> the analogy is between simple closed curves on your surface and, and vectors um, or, or basis elements. So you have K simplices now corresponding to um, what I'm gonna sometimes refer to as curve systems. And these are just K plus one disjoint um, simple closed curves up to isotopy. So, um, so in other words, uh, you, you have a vertex for every simple closed curve on your surface and you put an edge between uh, two vertices if those isotopy classes have representatives that can be realized disjointly. And it's a flag complex, meaning that, um, so I think Kayuba was telling us about this in slightly different language, but basically if you see a triangle, you fill it in. If you see a higher dimensional simplex, you fill it in. And it's actually a little proposition that uh, Ivanov wrote down carefully that um, it sort of doesn't matter how you define it um, in the sense that if, if you have a higher dimensional simplex where uh, vertices can be realized pairwise disjointly, actually all the curves in your simplex can be realized simultaneously disjointly. So you don't have to worry about that distinction too much. So maybe you didn't even worry about that in which case uh, we're good. Um, so one thing that, you know, um, given a certain number of talks involving the complex of curves. Um, so I just wanna mention one thing that a lot of times people sweep under the carpet, myself included, the distinction between um, or, or what happens with boundary components versus punctures. And this is one of the places where it's actually le legitimate to do that, okay? Um, so the curve complex, uh, doesn't see the difference between boundary components and curves. All it sees is that there's a hole there. Um, and by the way, I should say this, what this is meant to be is um, sort of four curves on a surface. And this is the subcomplex of uh, the, the curve complex that they span. So I've got these, this, if, if you can see these colors, um, I've got a red, a blue, and a purple curve, which are all pairwise disjoint. They form this triangle. And I've got a green curve here, uh, which is disjoint from this blue curve. So it's got an edge here, but um, no other edges because it intersects uh, the other two curves and can't be isotoped off of them. So, um, <clears throat> but it is uh, a, an infinite complex. It's a locally infinite complex. So, uh, we're obviously not able to draw a picture of the whole thing here. So, um, so there are a lot of references on complexes of curves. So I would refer you to Farb Margalit's book again, um, which is an excellent reference. Um, also, Saul Schleimer has some really nice notes um, that are Googleable. I think notes on the curve complex will get you there. Um, and, and there's a lot of interesting structure to this combinatorial object. So, um, you know, I'll say something a little bit more about this later, but, you know, if you think about this analogy between simple closed curves on a surface and, and vectors, I mean, it's sort of, it's not perfect. Um, you know, each of these curves could in some sense be taken as um, sums of the other two. So actually, you know, maybe a better analogy really um, with the tits building would be the barycentric subdivision of this complex. And that is going to be something that's important. Um, and it, it's basically Herer's go-to technique for proving a lot of his work. And we'll say more about that as we go. Okay, so Herer, what did he prove? Well, he proved a lot of things. And um, so, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about today, well, I think everything that I've ta I'm talking about today is written down in his 86 uh, Inventiones paper, uh, the virtual cohomological dimension of mapping class groups. But I wanted to mention he also has some lecture notes, uh, which I think are called the cohomology of, um, uh, uh, sorry, I don't remember what it is, cohomology of, of curves or something like that. Um, I'll check the reference and, and get it for you later, but it was published a couple years later and it contains a lot 
of the same information as in this, um, but with a lot more exposition of the background. So that can be a useful starting point if you're not familiar with it. Um, but anyway, so what he shows is that the, um, the curve complex has the homotopy type of a wedge of spheres of a certain dimension. And so from here on out, I'm not going to worry about the boundary component part because we've said that the mapping class or so the curve complex doesn't see that anyway. So I'm just going to forget my third um, index for the moment, my, my superscript. Um, <clears throat> so if I, if I do have Bs in here, then I just need to stick in N plus B everywhere I see an N, basically. Um, but, but this is the, uh, the main result, and you can see that there's sort of these special cases. Um, so there's, there's one formula for the genus zero case, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so, so we really think of this number M, uh, which is a function of G, N, and B, as the homotopy dimension of the curve complex, right? So... Um, but that's in contrast to its actual dimension. So I just wanted to write this down here. Um, so the actual dimension just corresponds to the number of curves in a pants decomposition for whatever surface that you're working on. And the, I, sh I should have said the curve complex, we don't allow uh, curves that are trivial. So things that can be, um, you know, isotope, like homotope to a point. Uh, or things that are, are peripheral to a boundary component or a puncture. So what we get as the, the actual dimension, the top dimensional, uh, the top dimension of a simplex um, is 3G plus N minus four. Um, and that's because you need 3G plus N minus three simple closed curves for a pants decomposition, okay? Um, so in other words, the curve complex um, has a lot more uh, dimension to it than its actual homotopy type. Okay, so I mean, what we're so what our business is going to be is first of all showing that this result is true, and then tomorrow's business is going to be actually finding those spheres and showing how to do that and some implications that come out of that. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so one thing that it turns out is useful to do. So, so the proof I'm gonna give you of Herr's theorem is not, not like Herr's proof, let me put it that way. So everything I'm gonna say or much of what I'm gonna say is implicit in Herr's proof. There are gonna be some places where I'm gonna introduce um, some simplifications um, and I'll, I'll sort of explain those as, as we go along. And, and one helpful way to think about um, the structure of the curve complex is, is to think about um, so, something like uh, the Berman exact sequence. So if you're, if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about this. This is just kind of motivation if you happen to know about this, but this is a tool that you use for inductive arguments and mapping class groups all the time. So if I have the, the mapping class group of the surface with punctures, so here just imagine n equals one. And then, so I'm taking the mapping class group of a surface with one marked point, and there my maps have to fix that marked point on the nose. Um, and, the iso and, and, so, and, and the isotopies do as well. And this map is just saying, well, forget that marked point pass to the surface, the closed surface, in the case n equals one. And what you lose by doing that is a copy of the fundamental group of the surface, because you're just pushing those points in all possible ways all around the surface. But you know, if you don't have to remember that marked point anymore in your isotopies, it just kind of springs back and, and um, you lose that extra information. So, um, so how might you do something like this for the curve complex? So you might try to say, well, what, you know, what happens if I just forget a curve on my surface? So here's, here's a nice, okay, I'll just make up a curve on my surface. So P is one of my marked points. And let's say that's the one I wanna forget. So if I forget P, what happens, right? Well. I get a perfectly good 
simple closed curve on my surface that represents an element of the curve complex for the surface with one fewer marked point. Okay, so that's fine. So that's that's no problem. So far, so good. So you know, I'm 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 trying to to maybe write down a map from the curve complex uh, for this surface to the curve complex with this surface. So so far, so good. But if you're if you're thinking ahead, you'll see that actually things go wrong pretty quickly because I could have something like this and. There, as soon as I forget this marked point, oops, right, then this bit would isotope to something that's peripheral to that marked point. So that's not going anywhere in the surface with one fewer marked point, okay? So I'm gonna put that marked point back in, but this is, um, this, Blue curve is a problem. And this red curve is no problem. Okay. And so I want to give some structure to this complex of curves. So um, let me just say here that, uh, let me introduce some notation. So let's say chi of SGN, uh, this is the subcomplex of the curve complex um, spanned by good curves. So in other words, ones that survive this process of forgetting a marked point. Um, and notice that any bad curve has to be a curve that surrounds precisely two marked points, one of which is the marked point that you're forgetting. That's actually the only thing that can go wrong. And just to motivate my notation, I notice that each such curve um, arises as the boundary of an arc connecting that marked point that we're forgetting to some other marked point, okay? So um, I'm gonna call this A sub P. These are the bad ones, okay? And it's A for arcs, okay? Um, and it turns out that, okay, so we get a map from chi to the curve complex with one fewer marked point. Now, this is not, um, an isomorphism. In particular, it's not injective, um, but it turns out it is a homotopy equivalence, and I'm going to explain that um, in a moment. So, okay. Um, right. So, now I'm saying that this is a proposition in here. You, you would be hard pressed to find it stated as such in error. Um, so uh, like I said, I'm gonna give a slightly um, different take on this, but if you, if you read Hera carefully, um, a lot of what I'm gonna say is implicit in there. But the proof of this I'm gonna give you um, is something that, um, uh, so let's see, let me write this down carefully. So the proof, um, uh, is in a paper that I have, which I'll be talking about later in the week with Nate Broadus and Andy Putman. And it, it uses um, a Hatcher flow technique, which, um, so there's an analog of the curve complex, which I'll be talking about more tomorrow called the arc complex, where you basically run the same game only using arcs such as the one I drew on the previous page instead of simple closed curves. Um, and so part of Herer's proof in this paper involves showing um, that that has nice connectivity properties. And Hatcher came along several years later and um, gave a much more streamlined, he has like a beautiful three page paper proving that. So I would, I would recommend that to you if you've not come across that. And he introduced this, I, this flow, um, which, uh, which, which we're gonna use here to, 
to, to work this out. But um, part of what we need to prove this is not just Hatcher flow. Um, we need uh, sort of a technical lemma. And this is your homework assignment for the problem session. So um, I gave a hint as to how to, to prove this um, in, in the tech file that I handed over to the organizers. So I hope they passed it on to you because I think it's useful. Not but basically, yet. what's that? Not yet. We'll pass it on when we have the exercise sessions. Right. OK, fair enough. Um, so you don't get the hint yet. So you can try it without the hint. And then, then, then if, you, if you feel that you need the hint, then you'll have it tomorrow. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, I, I don't need to read it off here. You basically have just a simplicial complex. And oops. Um, and then you know, you're, you're going to, so this star here is just the join. Um, and so you're gonna take the join with um, some discrete set. And basically what this is saying is that if you're trying to deduce when an inclusion is a homotopy equivalence, um, it suffices to look at links. That's, that's really what this exercise is saying. So, and I think we've seen that theme in, in some of the earlier talks today um, that, you know, if you wanna understand what's going on in, in these kinds of, of calculations, even for other groups, um, you know, you're, you're, you're really just, uh, it, it all boils down to understanding links in, in the right complexes. And that's certainly what's going on here. So for us, um, what is going on is, and again, I've tried to be careful with my notation here. So um, X is going to be this space that I've called chi, and um, A is going to be um, this uh, collection of, of arcs joining two marked points, one of which is P. Okay. So assuming the exercise that you're all going to, you know, go home and work carefully on, um, then we're gonna, we're gonna prove this, all right? So um, let's go back to drawing some pictures, right? So here is um, another sort of schematic. We have one of these bad arcs and we have, so that's alpha and we have the simple closed curve that arises as a regular neighborhood. Um, and what I have to show from the exercise, all I need to show is that this um, inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so um, what do we know about this? Well, okay, let me just, so we have this projection map that I defined before. Okay. Um, and we said, well, that's not an isomorphism, but actually we know that if I look at the composition, um, so I do get a simplicial isomorphism, right? So, I mean, if you just think about that for a second, right, what is the link of the curve gamma in the full curve complex here? It's anything that doesn't intersect gamma. It can't hit through that. So basically we're just thinking now of the disk that gamma bounds as, as a marked point. Um, so that gives us the isomorphism here and you can see that it actually goes through these two maps, okay? So um, we also know that, well, so this, this tells us that, um, sorry. Hang on a second. So we know that this inclusion induces um, an injection on uh, homotopy. So all we actually need is to show that this map, so um, I'll say want to show uh, that I star is a surjection. And that's enough to conclude that um, pi uh, is a homotopy equivalence as well, um, as well as the thing we're trying to show. So, um, okay. So how do we do that? Right, okay, so, so the game is just, just to reiterate, I'll pause before we go on here. The game is just to show that the link of gamma 
in the full curve complex here. Um, I'm sending that into the collection of the good curves, the ones that survive when I forget this marked point, right? And I just wanna show that um, that induces a surjection at the level of homotopy, right? Okay, so what do I need to do? Um, I'm going to map a, a sphere in, okay? And I probably shouldn't have used M here. I probably should have used K. So this is not the homotopy dimension. Um, let me just say, this is the beauty of, you could, most of you are too young to remember um, like actually using transparencies to give talks. But some of you might remember, and this is much easier to do on an iPad than it is to do on an actual transparency. So technology is good. Um, so I'm mapping a sphere in. And so what I want to do, let me just be explicit here. I'm, I'm fixing a dimension of my sphere and I'm going to fix uh, a simplicial structure um, on my sphere, right? So just find some nice way to write uh, my sphere as some kind of simplicial complex, some nice finite simplicial complex. And um, what I'm claiming that I can do, so remember alpha is the arc that defines the curve gamma. Okay, so I'm claiming that I can homotope this sphere off of that. And actually, if you think about it, all I need to do is make sure that this happens on the vertices of the sphere that I'm now calling SK. Okay. <clears throat> so how is that going to work? Now, here is where we have Alan Hatcher to the rescue with his Hatcher flow. This is not exactly what his flow is, but it's, it's, it's just a modification. So I'm going to take a representative of each of these. So I'm going to represent these by simple closed curves, delta 1 up to delta r. And so, you know, maybe I have delta i like this, you know, maybe it's intersecting this arc several times, and maybe I have delta j going through another couple of times. Okay, this is just a, a schematic picture. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna push, I'm gonna flow, um, each one in turn off of the arc. It's a pretty simple idea. This is, you know, the genius of, of Alan Hatcher uh, is these simple and beautiful ideas that, that are really powerful. So, um, so this is the, the point P. And so I'm gonna just flow it off of the end of the arc in a fixed direction. And the thing is I can just do this all at once for everything in a finite amount of time. So let's see if I can draw a non messy picture here. So I'm thinking of this map as being defined, um, you know, just inside this disc. So I'm, I'm thinking of this is all taking place inside some disc here. Um, so everything is fixed outside this disc and I'm just doing this flow kind of inside this disc. Okay, so this is Hatcher flow and, um, you know, th this is all I need to, to push my sphere into the, the set of good curves, okay? So um, this is, or to, to push it off, uh, sorry, to, to push it um, so that it doesn't intersect the arc alpha. Um, and that, that's it. So, um, so basically what we have, so let me, let me just write this here. So we now have a way to induct. Let me just go back here, right? So if I know that this curve complex is um, a wedge of spheres, so let me just draw this picture up here. 
So if I have a wedge of spheres, um, I'm only gonna draw two spheres and my spheres are all gonna be circles. So that's all I can draw. And I take the join with a, set, with a set of discrete points, right? So maybe here are two of my points. Well, look what I get. I get more spheres, right? So what this is telling me is that if I can just establish a base case, then I, I have a way to induct to know that if I start with spheres and um, I'm just throwing in more punctures, I'm just gonna keep getting spheres of higher dimensions, okay? So, um, so we just need some base cases and then we're done. Now, the problem is if you start looking at the simplest surfaces, you don't find spheres. So first of all, the curve complex um, for a sphere um, with fewer than four marked points um, doesn't have anything, like it, it's not there um, because you don't have any non-peripheral simple closed curves on such a surface. And even with slightly more complicated ones, so if you have four marked points um, on a sphere, um, then, then you get something uh, zero dimensional and um, they all intersect each other. So you don't get any, uh, you don't get any edges. And if you think about simple closed curves on a torus or a torus with one boundary component, Again, you just have a bunch of vertices and none of them are disjoint from each other. None of the simple closed curves on, on a torus are disjoint from each other. Um, so you just get an infinite set of vertices, nothing interesting. So the first interesting thing that happens is in S05. Okay, so a sphere with five marked points. And so let me show you what happens there. Um, so I'm just gonna draw the five marked points. So you'll know you're on a sphere, you'll just keep that in mind. So here is a simple closed curve. And, um, oops, that's not the one I want to draw. Um, and here is another simple closed curve. And so I get two vertices and they can be realized disjointly. So there's an edge between them, right? Well, now I'm just gonna keep sort of going around the circle. I'll use different colors in hopes that that's helpful to some people. So there's another one, which is disjoint from the second one I drew, but not from the first one. But now I can find another curve, which is disjoint from that guy, um, but not from any of the, uh, the two black ones here. Um, and now, uh, to complete my cycle, I'm going to just use a different color here. I've got this red one. And again, it's disjoint from two of the ones that I've drawn, but not the other two. So the point here is that I get a cycle. I get something that's homotopically a sphere, a circle in particular. And there are infinitely many such in the curve complex, but um, you know, up to homeomorphism on the surface, they all look like this. Um, we don't need to know that really, but, but what this is telling me is I have a one-dimensional simplicial complex and it has circles in it. So I'm actually, I'm finally getting my base case. I'm getting, I'm getting some spheres so that when I start doing my join, I'm going to get higher dimensional spheres and so on and so forth. Okay. And here's an exercise so if you don't like the exercise that I gave you, if you're already sort of expert in that kind of stuff and that kind of thing bores you, um, here's a different one you can do. So the complex of curves that I've just described to you um, is actually uh, isomorphic to the complex of curves for a torus with two marked points. So, I mean, I noticed that neither of these um, worked as a base case for me. So this is something to keep in the back of mind. Like we haven't said anything about what happens for closed surfaces. 
So we have to be sort of careful. We're gonna to have to go back and say something about that. And that's what I'm gonna talk about um, for the last few minutes of the talk. What's wrong with starting with S zeros and just saying joins of S zeros with S zeros is S ones? Um, well, so how do you know you're gonna get spheres? I guess, oh, I guess you will. Thanks. Yeah, you sorry, two, you're right. Points. Yeah, yes. okay. No, you're right, you're right. Sorry, I take it back. Well, it gave me a chance to talk about an interesting curve complex anyway, and we're going to need that here um, regardless, but you're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, yeah. So these cycles of length five, should I think of them in analogy to those apartments that were hexagons in the, in the building case? Yes. So that was, and thank you, that was part of my motivation for wanting to, to draw this picture, regardless of the fact that, um, you know, as Jeremy has pointed out, I think that was Jeremy. Um, I can't, I can't actually see, but it sounded like Jeremy. Was that Jeremy? Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, so, um, so he's right that we don't need this for a base case, but it's really helpful, and this is one of the rare cases where we can just draw a picture, like here, here is, one of our cycles. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that uh, later on, but this, this is something to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do want to throw in this exercise, even though we don't really need it here, um, just for fun. Um, so how do we draw a torus? Yeah, this is just to test if you really understand curve complexes. So you have a torus and um, let's remove two mark points. I'm gonna make one of them be the corner point. So the torus is just my square with my usual identifications, like so, like so. And let's take the other one in the middle. So you might notice if I draw it that way, um, I mean, it's not really five marked points, but it kind of looks like five marked points. And so maybe that's a hint for how to do the exercise. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, maybe an unnecessary diversion, but definitely a fun one. So I encourage you to give that a whirl. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> okay. So what we do need is some kind of, so, we all believe we can induct once we have some number of marked points, hopefully at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, we still need to figure out what happens um, in the closed surface case. Okay, so what we need to do is show that in the closed surface case, I get spheres of dimension 2G minus two. Okay, that, that's the dimension that we're going for. And, and that here, is upside down, right? Oh, did I? You know, I realized I was doing that. Like at some point when I was writing this up, yes, it's upside down. Thank you. And I went back and I tried to change them all. <laughs> and I, I guarantee you I've missed some others. Thank you for catching that one. You can, you can let me know so that at least the slides will be okay. Um, okay, so. So I want to introduce the first barycentric subdivision of the curve complex. So here is a, a, a two simplex coming from these three simple closed curves. And I'm gonna add in um, vertices um, like so. And this is not gonna give me an apartment um, before Cayuva asks me. Um, so, all right, I've got, uh, well, maybe I'll not label that in the middle. So that, that's, oops, gonna be A, B, C, okay, like so. And um, so the weight of um, a vertex in, the barycentric subdivision is just going to be the dimension of the original simplex that it came from. So here I'm going to have a weight one 
Uh, these are my weight one vertices, and this is my weight two uh, vertex. These are weight zero, um, and so on. Okay. And I'm going to use this weight to, to decompose the barycentric subdivision in a useful way. So the Hatcher flow part, the induction on the number of marked points, that's, that's something that it's kind of, you know, if you read here carefully, you can see like traces of that there. Um, but, you know, the, he didn't have the, the machinery of, of Hatcher flow, so he, he didn't use that. But this this is um, this is Herer's idea directly. This this decomposition of this the barycentric subdivision. So okay, so there I've drawn it again, and here's how we're gonna decompose that. So Z sub K um, is just the subcomplex of the barycentric subdivision spanned by vertices of weight at least K. So that means that Z zero is the whole thing. Um, and Z one is this little Y shaped graph. I mean, so here I'm, I'm obviously just doing like the part of, uh, you know, the, the curve complex that we were seeing. There's obviously more to it than this. And here's Z two. Um, it's just this, this single vertex of, of weight, one, uh, weight two uh, in this case. Okay. So again, obviously there's, there's lots more, but this is just a way that we can kind of control and build up as we go. And um, so I'm just going to do the last stage of Harris construction here, because that's really all, all you need and it encodes all the ideas, but you could do this um, sort of going from one level to any other level. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a vertex that is um, in Z0, but not Z1. Okay. So, um, so in other words, that's just going to be a curve on my surface. Okay. But in general, it's going to be some curve system. Okay. And I'm going to cut my surface. Now here, now it matters that I chose a non-separating curve as my random example. So you need a slightly different version of this if you're dealing with a separating curve, okay? So, um, okay, so we're gonna cut along C and we get, um, I'll call that S sub C. <clears throat> so what is the link in Z1 of this vertex V? Well, it's just the curve complex of S sub C, which, and here's where you're gonna need a slightly different argument if, you're, um, if you were dealing with a separating curve, but the example I'm showing you is gonna be the same idea. Um, so we're getting the curve complex of a surface with two boundary components, which we're just gonna treat as marked points and one smaller genus. And if we're doing an induction argument, then this is homotopy equivalent to spheres of dimension um, 2G minus, uh, 2G minus one minus three plus two. Um, so if I've done this, it's always dangerous to do this from memory. I usually like to have all those layered formulas in front of me. I think this is 2G minus three. Um, and that's exactly what we want because in order to get the whole thing back, right? I am just, um, I'm basically adding in um, V, right? I mean, of course I'm doing this simultaneously for all the different V at the same time, um, but I'm just getting V times, uh, sorry, join with this link. Um, and so I'm going to get dimension um, 2G minus two. And that's it. That's, 
that's really the whole, um, that's, that's Hare's proof of the, um, that the curve complex has uh, homotopy type uh, spheres, uh, equivalent of spheres, infinite wedge of spheres of a, an appropriate dimension. So, so there's, yeah, there's two parts of it is, and it's really just like one big induction proof. It's the, the Hatcher flow idea helps you deal with marked points. And then um, this idea of, of just um, using the barycentric subdivision to realize that you're essentially doing something similar um, for closed surfaces just by cutting and reducing down. It's a very standard type of argument um, in, in the world of math and class groups. So, um, okay, so all I want to, so maybe I just want to spend the last um, four minutes. Um, okay, <laughs> Peter is nodding. Um, so let me just, uh, okay, okay. I'm gonna recap. See, I wrote down all my formulas here just in case, um, just in case I, I needed to refer to them quickly. So, I mean, we've been seeing notions of duality um, all day. And I just wanted to kind of emphasize how they're playing out for us in this context. And, and I'm gonna talk more about this tomorrow, um, but you know, how, how does Hare use the ideas that we just talked about to prove that the mapping class group um, has the virtual cohomological dimension that it does. And I've, I've written this down here. So this is actually this first statement here is really the main theorem of Herrer's paper. Um, and, you know, again, it comes back to the space, Teichmuller space. And, you know, if, if you pay attention and maybe it's easier just to focus on the closed surface examples, you know, if, if, you're, if you're up on your duality theory, you know, this makes perfect sense that um, if you take the sum of the VCD and the homotopy dimension of the curve complex, uh, then you're gonna get Teichmuller space dimension. Um, but well, you're gonna be off by one, but um, so, so I just wanna remind you why that is. And I, I think most of you know this, um, and, and certainly we, we've seen this uh, earlier today. So I, I wrote this down for Poincaré duality, and now I'm not sure why, but, um, but basically if you take a KG1 space um, of a certain dimension, and so um, I'm thinking of the moduli space here, which is not quite a KG1, it's an orbifold KG1, but let's just pretend. Um, you know, and, and I wanna think about uh, its universal cover. So again, I've written this down for Poincaré duality, but just, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, I get this uh, relation um, between the kth cohomology of X um, over ZG and the D minus K minus one homology of the boundary of the universal cover um, integrally, right? And so this is, this is the curve complex, right? So this is what we're seeing here. So, you know, if you're a duality group of dimension um, V, so V is your, your VCD, right? So this is telling you that, um, you know, I have this equality here and um, this is all gonna be zero uh, except in that dimension, in, except in your VCD. And so for us, so I, I just kind of wanted to recap what's going on with duality for us is that um, you know, I have this, this top cohomology um, and you know, so in other words, if I wanna understand Steinberg modules, which I'm gonna talk more about tomorrow, like what I really want to do is understand the homology of the boundary of my space, which is the curve complex. Now, now why is that? So, 
If you remember that tight molar space, I'm gonna just draw, I'm gonna end with this picture. Um, you know, tight molar space was all about these parameters introduced um, with pants decomposition. So here's a pants decomposition. But I can think of the curve complex as sitting kind of at the boundary of tight molar space. So actually it's really abortification. And like I said, I'm gonna talk more about this tomorrow, but I can, I can just pinch this curve to a point. And as I make it smaller and smaller and smaller, I'm sort of traveling through tight molar space. But when it pinches to a point, I'm not in tight molar space anymore because I'll have what's called a nodal curve. So something like this. So I still have some thickness there, right? So this is not in tight Miller space. Um, and this is not exactly the right way to bordify tight Miller space, but we'll see this more tomorrow. Um, but it should hopefully convince you that there's a copy of the curve complex or something at least very similar to it, sort of hanging on at the outside of tight Miller space that is making um, making us have this relation amongst the dimensions. So I'll stop there. So thank you. Let's thank Tara. Are there questions first in Zoom and maybe I'll let Peter handle the in-person questions. It looks like Cayuva has a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People sorry. should just talk. I think there aren't enough of us that will talk yeah. over each other. So um, about the apartments, is there in general a combinatorial description of subcomplexes of the curve complex that I should think of as apartments, like um, starting with a pair of pens or something like that? So what would be a what would be the analog of apartments? So that's tomorrow's lecture. <laughs> oh, I, okay. <laughs> I mean, let me just raised. say that it's not obvious. And so, I mean, so Hare, you know, so so we have the framework that's given to us by, um, you know, so so we can follow sort of the Solomon Tits um, program, and um, you know, Hare Hare basically does that. So. Um, and he obtains the first part of what they do, but the like the apartments, like you just don't get that for free in the mapping class group setting. Um, and so it wasn't for another like 20 years until um, Nate Broadus did his work that we had that second piece of it. So, um, so I'm gonna explain that a little bit tomorrow. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's not at all obvious, like here's the curve complex, find some non-trivial spheres. Um, I mean, they, yeah, there's a reason there was a 20 year gap because yeah, it's just, um, it's a place where the sort of the easy analogy breaks down. No, it's a really good question. I was, I was trying to motivate that question by, by drawing that picture. <laughs> so thank you, Kayuba. A question. So, say genus zero and no mark points. You know, the mapping class group isn't an interesting object, but you know, moduli space is a, still a reasonable homotopy type. You know, because you could just it could just be B of automorphisms. So you know, it's like B S O three. Um, you should probably think of as gee, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but something like that is the genus zero, no mark points moduli space, it, is there any like duality there? Like I assume everything you're gonna tell us, there's gonna be the assumption that on genus number mark points to make diff zero contractible, but yeah, is there anything reasonable to say? Well, you know, so basically, um, you know, I think the answer is that in those other cases, so those are often known as the sporadic cases in the literature, 
you just, it turns out you're dealing with some other group that you already know. And so you just use the theory that you know there. So, um, you know, you, you don't need yeah. the mapping class group stuff until you're doing something that's properly a mapping class group. Like the Taurus is a great example. Um, so, you know, the curve complex of the Taurus um, is, is just an infinite collection of, you know, of, of points. Um, you know, so, so none of this is very, you know, you can't do any of this in that case. But of course, that mapping class group is just SL2Z, right? So yeah. like, you already know, I mean, you, you just borrow whatever results you need from, um, from that case. So, I mean, it, it's not a, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess we could go through and list yeah. the sporadic cases and figure out what the get out of jail free card is in each case, but that's basically what you do. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I said was a manifold, so the dualizing module would be Z, but maybe I was hoping that you'd come up with a fancy top, you know, simplicial space <laughs> whose, you know, that had Z as, uh, you know, one of its homology groups, which you know, I think is kind of silly, but um, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, maybe you could, but I haven't thought about that. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you're asking me if I have, then the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know that coming up with this Z in a fancy way is useful. <laughs> that could be interesting. Yeah. Any other questions from online? Any questions here? I actually had, I wrote down questions during your talk and you always answered them a, min a minute later. So uh, <laughs> you actually did really <laughs> explain everything well. Uh, so let's thank Tara again. Uh, it can, oh, I have to stop the recording. <laughs>